Hello, Barbies, Kens, Days, and Thems. Welcome to a special episode of Nicole Reacts, where I, Nicole, react to online marketing gurus that I find that other people help me find and occasionally who find me on the internet. My qualifications for marketing snark and commentary are that I've owned a marketing company for almost 17 years. In that time, having worked with hundreds of clients on marketing strategy and implementation. So I know a fair bit when it comes to online marketing, but also related topics like search engine optimization and website development. So a lot of places have some kind of holiday special. And on this channel, we have a tradition, and this is the third year we've done it, so I can call it a tradition at this point, where I react to videos that are about doing holiday marketing. And I usually wear an ugly Christmas sweater when I do it. And the only channel that seems to consistently produce this content is GoDaddy. And what's hilarious is that the video that we're going to watch today, which is called GoDaddy webinar, discover how to master your holiday marketing has a total of 55 views and the channel has over 200,000 subscribers. Yikes. I mean, my videos get those kind of views, but I have less subscribers than GoDaddy does. Now, if you want to go watch past holiday episodes, the last two I've done, I will link them in the show notes. But in case you don't want to, I am just going to summarize very briefly what these GoDaddy holiday marketing trainings are about so that we can compare this one to the previous ones. And if I could summarize them, it would be these four major ideas. First of all, related to holiday marketing, make sure your website is ready. They're assuming, obviously, that if you're watching an online marketing training that you probably have some kind of website or online component to your business versus just a physical location. For example, if you are going to have a series of coupon codes, are those loaded into the website and scheduled to start working when they're supposed to start working and probably stop working when they're supposed to stop working? Do you have some pricing changes that are coming up? If so, who is doing those pricing changes and when are they doing them? Do people need to be reminded of things like, for example, the last order date before Christmas so that they get their product in time? And how are you going to warn them about that? Are you going to put a big banner on the top of every page of your website telling people order by December 20th for Christmas delivery? Are you going to put it in the shopping cart as they're checking out? Maybe have a pop up before they check out to say, hey, you know, if you order this after December 20th, you might not get it in time for Christmas. Maybe you should buy a gift certificate instead or, you know, however you want to handle that. So basically, just like you're going to take your business and maybe decorate its physical location for the holidays, you probably want to go through your website and make sure your website reflects what's going on the upcoming holiday season especially related to selling your products and services. The second thing that they want you to do, and probably you should generally do with bigger things in your marketing, are create what are called campaigns. The idea of a campaign is that your various marketing channels, ideally online and offline, are working together toward a common goal. So for example, if you know that you're having a Black Friday sale, okay, do you want to start posting leading up to the Black Friday sale, the kinds of things that you're getting, whether it's new products or a package you're putting together. How do you want to build excitement on social media for that? Who is going to make them? When are they scheduled to go out? If you're doing email or text marketing, what kinds of emails or texts need to go out? When do they need to go out? Again, who's doing them? Should there be any messaging on the website about the Black Friday sale? When should that go online? Do you have maybe some kind of shopping or, or frequent buyer group? Should they be the first to know about the Black Friday sale? Do you want to accommodate them somehow in the Black Friday sale? Like maybe letting them come into the store an hour early and shop first or something like that. All I'm saying is that you think through, okay, Black Friday sale, and then you think through all the different channels you're going to use. And ideally, you're using the same messaging, you're timing things correctly, and maybe you're also using... So the same graphics across all of them so that if I get the email update and then I see the Facebook ad, I put those two things together because it seems like they go together. And they, I don't think said this directly, but if you're doing offline marketing stuff, making sure that matches up too. So thinking about larger marketing things as a campaign is a pretty basic idea, but you know, they talked about that and they used the sort of campaign idea to talk about basically GoDaddy's version of Canva. 
they have a sort of graphic design online program where you can make, you know, sale graphics and they can be different sizes and orientations so they can, like I said, be used in social media or as your email header or whatever and have it all match. So campaigns are a generally good idea um, for holiday marketing or otherwise. The third thing they want you to do is to measure your efforts. So for example, if you're going to do all this work, right, you're going to run this campaign, you know, on email and social media and all that, you'd want to see what actually got people to purchase something on Black Friday. Maybe the ads purchased 80% of your sales or something, but there's no way to know that unless you set up a way to measure your success. So they talked in general about this. Honestly, I think this should be a whole specific training for small businesses because it is a lot to think about and seeing examples of how it's implemented across, you know, different website platforms or what kinds of data people can get, I think would be really helpful for small business owners, but instead they usually keep it pretty general. And what also bugs me when people talk about analytics is they'll say acronyms sometimes, but they won't define them. So it makes them sound really smart, but it makes the person watching it feel stupid. So in one of them, for example, I think they just mentioned KPIs. Like everyone knows that that is a key performance indicator. And an example of a KPI would be, you know, what is the abandoned cart rate? And so maybe my abandoned cart rate, maybe I want it to be 50% or below. And when I measure it, it's 80%. Okay. So if I know that my KPI is higher than I want it to be in my abandoned cart, how would I fix that? Maybe I would try offering free shipping. Maybe I would offer a free gift with a purchase over a certain amount of money. Maybe I would send abandoned cart emails to the people who abandon their cart to remind them to come back and finish checking out, right? So if I measure the problem, I can see maybe some different ways I could solve it. Now you can't measure data after the fact, right? So if you do wanna measure something, you have to make sure that there is some kind of tracking in place for you to do that before the holiday season. And this way you can get your data after and you can use that to inform your marketing for the upcoming year or even the next holiday season in general. And the fourth thing, which is kind of a thread throughout is this idea of having branding related to your business and having every piece of marketing content you make match your branding so that not only does everything build upon everything else, but also so that if someone sees your cool Instagram post about the upcoming Black Friday sale at your boutique, that they're not mixing it up with the other boutique down the street. So you get credit for your own marketing work and it will help build your business's reputation over time. Obviously the four things I just went over are pretty basic. But if you were new to business ownership or if you're just the kind of person that doesn't really have a marketing mind, so it's nice to be sort of refreshed on the general concepts so you can keep them in mind, these kind of trainings can be helpful. Now, the two things I hope GoDaddy spends more time on in this training than they previously have are based on the questions that come up when I talk with small businesses about their marketing, which is business branding and tracking Data. So I think most businesses and most people generally understand that branding is important. And when we talk about large companies like Nike, that you can see a print ad of Nike. And before you even see the little swish, you know that it's a Nike ad and that these companies spend millions of dollars on branding because it brings them more than that back in terms of sales. But I think most small businesses just have no idea where to start with it. And for them, I have a video. I'm going to link it in the show notes. I just picked kind of three branding guidelines to sort of give some ideas about it. So check that out if you want to kind of think about your business branding a little bit more in detail, but maybe aren't ready to take a whole on branding course or something. And the second thing is that I think most businesses want to track their data. I think that the things they run into are what data can I track? How will I know that? the thing I set up is actually tracking data. Like where, where do I go check that? And what is a normal number? And if it's below normal, how do I fix it? So 
let's use my sillier example from earlier of my 80% abandoned cart rate on my fake website. So A, this is idea that I can actually track the abandoned cart rate. That might be new to a lot of people. Number two, like where do I look in my website analytics for that? So this could be, you know, links to places that I could check it on Shopify, on WordPress and other common platforms. And number three, what is a normal abandoned cart rate? I have my number, but like, is it normal? Is it low? Is it high? And I don't know the answer to that. So I'm going to let editing Nicole come in and talk about what is a normal abandoned cart rate. It seems like obviously this is going to range. The typical abandoned cart rate is around 70%. And it looks like this can obviously vary by device type or by what industry you're in or whatever, but around 70%. I think that once people know, for example, that they have an abandoned cart rate and that it's kind of high, they'll know that they should fix it, right? So the branding and the tracking are the things that I think most people get a little overwhelmed by. So hopefully GoDaddy will go into it a little bit more in this training. Oh, by the way, if you like my videos, do you mind hitting the like button or sharing them or whatever? It really does help. And I always forget to ask. Thanks for considering it. We are live. Um, you're in the right spot for today's webinar, Surviving the Holiday Hustle Strategies for Peak Season Success. Everyone, my name is Jeffrey, and I am a GoDaddy webinar manager, and I am joined by the amazing Jessica Phillips, not only an amazing content strategist, not only amazing graphic artist, but just an amazing person in general, but also all knowing things of content. Um, and you're probably thinking, okay, like, great, but like, really knowing how to make sure that you're showcasing your brand and showcasing it in the right way. And I'm gonna let her, her introduce herself in just a moment. Um, but really just want to share that we're really thankful that you're all here today. One, two, getting ahead of the curve and getting ready for your holiday strategy. And three, just down to learn and get some new knowledge. In. I'm going to turn over to... So just a little editing note, this was posted two weeks ago, and I'm recording this on October 13. So this was posted at the beginning of October. So I guess if a business signs up for a holiday marketing webinar at the beginning of October, they're probably a business that cares about how the holiday season is going to go generally. So Jessica, and then we're going to jump into webinar just a little bit. But again, welcome everyone. Let us know where you're from, your business name in the chat. And if you already have questions, whether that's pertaining to content or your holiday marketing strategy, go ahead and put that in the chat box. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. Thanks, Jeffrey. Hi, everyone. Like I said, I'm Jessica, uh, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the holidays with you guys. Um, as a content strategist here at GoDaddy, I help make data-driven recommendations for the types of content that help small businesses connect with their audiences and grow online. Uh, I study consumer behavior and trends in content online to help make the most of your marketing efforts year round, especially during the holidays. And while we know this season, it brings a lot of- So just quickly from a programming standpoint, I don't know why Jeffrey's still in the shot. If I was producing this, I would hide myself as the producer after I introduced the speaker. And then I would highlight the speaker or pin the speaker in Zoom so that Jessica as the presenter would stay in that upper right corner throughout her presentation. And she would be our sole visual focus. Joy. It also brings incredibly busy schedules with lengthy to-do lists. So but with the right uh, preparation and resources, um, you can easily take advantage of all the opportunities this season brings. Our goal here today is to help you connect with your audience, boost those sales, and ultimately end the year on a high note. We'll let Jeffrey catch up for our slides a little bit. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So our, our agenda today is packed with useful insights that will help you get ahead, a head start on the what, the why, and the how of holiday marketing. So we'll cover how to lay the foundation of your strategy by understanding your customers and their shopping habits, as well as how to optimize your strategy for your business, because as we know, it's not one size fits all. Then we'll talk about how to jumpstart those buying decisions and ways to create engaging holiday campaigns. And we'll round out our show and tell with a look at post-holiday maintenance and the importance of nurturing your audience well into the new year. We'll end things with an interactive Q&A to answer a few of your questions you may have about your own holiday marketing. And by the end of this session, you'll be set to brave the holiday season all on your own 
So let's get started. So when we think about our holiday strategy this year, I want you to start with a solid foundation. Your solid foundation in this case is your audience. Let's start by getting to know your audience. Sorry, let's start to getting to know your customers a little bit. Things like their demographic or what platform they respond to the best are a great start. But the secret sauce in all of this is understanding them as real people. The you know what? I did forget about this one in my summary. They typically do spend time talking about your customer avatar, which is this idea that you probably have an ideal customer. And that customer probably not only has some demographics associated with them, like their age or their gender or their location, but also, you know, maybe they have certain kinds of books that they like to read. Maybe there's certain places they like to go on vacation. Maybe they drive a certain kind of car. So basically like this idea of getting to know your customer intimately so that as you create content, you can create content that appeals to them and talks directly to them. So yeah, I did forget that. So now it's pretty a basic one that I shouldn't have forgotten. Holidays are just as busy for them as they are for you. So let's take a look well, yeah. at some key findings to better understand how you could show up for them this season. It's probably not a surprise, but 72% of holiday shoppers prefer to buy online. Yeah. The big reason? Convenience. Every year, it feels like things are getting busier and busier. Also, there's just better deals online. I mean, people have talked about how Black Friday has really gone down in recent years, like how you used to be able to get a $5 TV or something. I'm exaggerating, but you get what I mean. And I think you just genuinely find if you're going to find a deal, you're going to find it online versus in the store. So people are just like, why would I get in my car, drive somewhere, deal with crowds of people to not find my thing when I can just sit at home and look for it there and probably find the best deal on it that I can find. We're all juggling family plans, surviving hectic work schedules, and booking holiday travel. In the same study, it showed that convenience, discounts like free delivery, and the ability to price check items were the top three reasons to shop online. So what does this mean for us? There are two important things to take away here. We wanna make it easy for your audience to find you online, and we wanna make it easy for them to shop with you online, meeting them where they're at. This looks like having up-to-date links in your page bios or providing a shoppable link on your stories or your social posts to make it that much more convenient. Speaking of making it easier and more convenient for folks to find you, Google is no longer the first place folks look during the holidays. One out of four shoppers plan to use social media to search for holiday products. These numbers I mean, one out of four is significant, but I think most people do start with a search engine when they're looking for something, but numbers are even higher with younger generations like Gen Z. And I want to note that the oldest Gen Z is turning 27 this year. Uh, and I, I only mentioned that because they have quite a lot of buying power online. So I don't want anybody to count them out just because they are a little bit of a younger generation because they're not really that young anymore. This means you can and should leverage social media algorithms to help your business get in front of more eyes. So we know shoppers want to buy online and we know they'll be looking on social media to help inspire their purchases. But a key piece we're missing is the when. When do I plan? When do I post? So when we think about the holiday season, what we often see is the time between Thanksgiving and New Year's Eve, which isn't wrong, but this year we'll need to make the most of what's already a short holiday season with only 27 days between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which was a surprise to me earlier this year when I was looking that up. <laughs> For example, Cyber Monday is in December this year, so everything's really compact. This just means planning early is going to be the key to your success. And just a little tip, because of this shortened time frame, if you're someone who does uh, ship products or um, has to send services somewhere, uh, make sure that we're A, keeping in mind that shorter shipping window, and then B, keeping your followers and audience and customers updated if there's going to be delays in that. Because we know every year nothing, there's always a hiccup in some sort of shipping. So so I don't think a shortened holiday season is necessarily a bad idea. To make an analogy, Kamala Harris, in her bid for the U.S. presidency, has raised over a billion dollars, I think as of earlier the week that I'm recording this. And I think it's not just the most that has been raised by a candidate in such a short period of time, but maybe the most that's ever been raised by a candidate. And I think there's a, a lot of reasons for that. Don't don't get me wrong. But I think I'll, part of it is that the time between when she became a presidential nominee 
to the election time is relatively short. So I think that has given the campaign some energy that it wouldn't have had if she would have been running for the last two years. So in some ways, I'm wondering if this is going to work out well for small businesses because there isn't going to be this Christmas fatigue because let's face it, the second Halloween is over, everything is Christmas in pretty much every retail location everywhere. So I'm going to say the shortened holiday period might actually work out better for us small business owners who are trying to sell things online. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, let's get back to it. So just how early is too early then to plan a post? Well, according to Pinterest, to maximize those holiday opportunities, you need to start promoting your holiday ideas and products months before the actual holidays arrive. Consistent, timely marketing throughout the season leads to the best results. So what do we recommend? You need to split your strategy into three separate goals here, starting as early as July. And I know we're in September, but um, I'll walk you through a few of these goals. So laying your foundation for discovery uh, and growing your audience through September is going to help you really build that audience, build that trust with your followers. Then you want to take that and activate those buying decisions. Okay. I've been in marketing for like 20 years and I don't know what laying the foundation for discovery means here. I'm guessing what it means is that you don't start your Instagram account in October, but that you start posting content throughout the summer and getting people sort of not only starting to follow you, but also starting that sort of consistency that your audience can come to expect. I think that's what it might mean, but yeah, I hope maybe she'll get into it more, but I, I have no idea what she's talking about here about laying the foundation of discovery. So really push your products, that sort of thing. Um, and take advantage of the early planners from October through November since most folks wrap up their shopping before December even starts. Finally, nurture your audience and launch a New Year's. Did she say most people finish their holiday shopping before December starts? I don't know if that's true. Editing Nicole is going to fact check this. As expected, a majority of people do most of their shopping in December. Here is a picture of a Gallup poll that was done in 2023 which I will link to in the show notes. But if we're looking for a number, 8% of people are going to finish their holiday shopping before December, somewhere around that number. Thanks, Editing Nicole. Campaign in the first weeks of Q1, which we will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. If your brand has special connections or offerings for specific holidays, I've also got a chart here um, where you can- In Christmas, it says August through December. Oh my God, please don't start in August. I know that some people do, but don't. You can see the big holiday moments and the peak ad opportunities for each. For example, for example, we're already well into like a peak Halloween ad season. I'm sure everyone's been seeing Halloween stuff in stores and online. Um, and we're fast approaching that window for Black Friday and Cyber Week, like Cyber Monday and Black Friday. That being said, as holiday shoppers prepare for this celebration pack season, they'll be actively searching for all sorts of ideas and inspiration to make this this best season yet. What we want from this and starting early is to take advantage of this moment in time and influence their big and small holiday decisions while they're still in planning mode rather than catching them a little too late. So now that we've chatted a timeline, uh, let's cover a few extra things to consider when laying the foundation uh, for your campaigns this season. Your strategy isn't one size fits all, and we want your brand to shine through authentically online. That's why, sorry, my notes got a little jumbled there. That's what, uh, showing up authentically is what's gonna help you stand out, is what I'm trying to say. First, we wanna keep it casual. Lean into the ways uh, your specific brand can help support the celebrations happening this season. Think about the natural ties between what you offer and how people celebrate. Okay. She, okay. I was going to say it would help if she had an example and then she started to say, maybe, sorry, Jessica, I didn't mean to cut you off. Your products are especially relevant for a topic like gifting or a service that can ease the stress of the season. It should feel like a natural place for your brand to fit in. I think seeing a couple of examples here would be helpful showing how an approach can be casual in particular when it feels like this time of year, everybody wants to make a buck, but Second, we want to help people plan multiple moments at once. I know we just talked about a timeline for posting, but our holiday shoppers have overlapping needs throughout the season. They're not, you know, one, then the next. So they might be shopping for a gift exchange while planning 
Thanksgiving dinner while picking decor for New Year's Eve all at okay. once. So can okay, that was helpful. Concrete examples are helpful. Got it, got it. Consider how and where your brand can fit in to show up for them throughout the process. Lastly, let's make gifting a breeze. People come into this season open-minded and undecided about what to buy. Shoppers may not know what they're looking for, but they do know who they're looking for. So try catering your campaigns or assets towards gifting to different audiences like moms or pet parents or fitness lovers, um, crafting lovers. I know I saw a crafting business in the, uh, in the chat. So um, again, and all throughout this, showing up early and often through all of your planning is going to be the biggest thing. I did a video a couple of years ago about three different ways you can approach making a gift guide as part of your business where, you know, you're recommending certain products to certain kinds of people. I will link it in the show notes in case you want to watch it. Okay. So, all right. Now that we've discussed the foundation of your campaign, who you're talking to and when you're talking to them, let's talk about what and how to post to make your content stand out amongst the holiday hustle and bustle this year. This time of the year, there's so much happening online. When you add that attention spans are getting a little bit shorter every year, I feel, cutting through the noise can make a big difference on holiday. Well, Jeffrey's having a really good time at this webinar. I wish I was enjoying myself half as much as he is right now. He's smiling. He's laughing. He has his hand on his chest. I'm just saying we should all be having as much fun as Jeffrey is in general. Sales. To boost visibility for your brand, it's important to understand what platforms are prioritizing on their feeds and how to work those things into your holiday campaigns. Algorithms are changing all the time, but here are a few things we've seen this year that we're sure can help. The first are high quality photos. We know that during the holidays, high quality photos are key. They help showcase your products and services, excuse me, and clearly set expectations for potential customers so they know exactly what they're getting when they buy online. It's kind of hard to set those expectations if you're not physically with something. So these clear product photos will help. Pairing them with formats like carousels on Instagram, so those formats where there's multiple photos in one post, is an easy way to boost engagement. Mo mo like in those cases, you have more photos per post, which equal more opportunities for likes, comments, and shares. It's also more work for you as a business owner to obviously find up to 10 photos for an Instagram post instead of one. So what you could do to see if this works for you is you could decide, okay, this month for one post a week on Instagram, I'm going to do a carousel. And ideally what you'll want to do is for each of the four weeks of the month, post the carousel at a random different time. So week one, maybe you post it Monday morning at 8am and maybe week two, you post it Thursday afternoon at 4pm, you know, so this way you can sort of get the time date factor sort of out of the way. And then what you can do is look at your Instagram stats at the end of the month and see, did those carousel posts get more engagement? And did, did they get so much more engagement that it was worth the extra work of creating them? So if they got like 2% more engagement, you might say, well, <laughs> that took me an extra 20 minutes to do. So maybe that wasn't worth it to me. Uh, but at least you would have the, the data to sort of make that decision. So in general, it does seem like carousel posts do well, but you'll want to test this for your business to see if it's a worthwhile thing to do. Our second tip for cutting through the noise is to use video content. Um, I'm sure everybody saw this coming. So if you're not using video, this is a great time to start. We know that many platforms like Instagram have updated algorithms to prioritize video content on their feeds. And we also know that 91%, which is a huge number of marketers, have seen a boost in traffic to their site when using video. So as a small business owner, incorporating video content into your holiday marketing strategy can be a powerful way to keep um, your audience engaged. A great use of videos during the holidays is uh, I have a couple ideas, but to show a peek behind the curtain uh, with behind the scenes content. So showing your followers what you do in a day, how you pack orders, or even highlight employees if you have them. It might seem- I'm going to take this moment to plug our Trend to Send service shamelessly because I think it's really good for this kind of thing. So Trend to Send is a service where you sign up for twice weekly text messages. And the text message has two parts to it. It has links to tr a trending piece of audio that I found on Instagram and TikTok. And if I can find it, I'll also include the YouTube link as well. And it includes a video 
of me explaining the trend, showing examples of the trend, and then doing a version of the trend myself. This video is usually about two minutes long, so it's not super long or anything. This way, you don't just get a link to a trending audio and then have to look through 100 videos to get what's going on. I just tell you what it is. <laughs> and then you can record a version of it yourself. And because you have the links to it on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, you can, when you post it, you can link it to the trending audio. So we have someone who started last week and she only posted one of the two trends, but the video she posted of the trending thing that we sent got 10 times more views than her videos typically get. Because not only are they sort of fun and short, they're under 15 seconds typically, they're also part of sort of this larger thing going on in the internet at any given time. So you're getting a lot more views and interactions in general when you post these things. And I will say, because I make a version of the trend too, right, as part of the video, because I want to make sure that it's actually doable for people. So I do it myself. Between filming and editing, it is typically about 15 minutes total. Sometimes it's a little more if it's more involved and there's more shots. Sometimes it's a little bit less, but it's around that 15 minute mark. So I think if most small businesses could spend 15 minutes or less and have a piece of video content that people were going to like, I think they would do it. Anyway, if you want to learn more, you can visit trendtosend.com and uh, check it out. Sign up for a month and see if you like it. And you can either just get the text messages or you can get the text messages plus editing or you can get the text messages plus editing plus posting. So whatever level of help you need, but you can start with the text if you want to just see if you like it. Sorry, I couldn't help saying anything. It's just that it's taken me a few years to figure out this solution to this problem I've seen my clients having of making these videos. So I'm just like really excited about it, but all right, let's, let's watch. Daunting, but successful video content can be created using just a smartphone and simple editing tools. Um, and some of those can even be found on the platforms themselves. The key is to focus on delivering valuable content that speaks to your audience, reflects your brand, and provides an authentic experience for followers. Basically, people just want to know the human behind the brand. That's what makes a big impact. And finally, when it comes to engagement, sharing is caring. So most platforms are prioritizing content that encourages sharing on and off the app, sending things in DMs, sending a text to somebody, hey, look at this video, look at this post I saw. When planning your content, sprinkle in a few posts that ask for interaction with your audience or entertain viewers um, or follow a popular trend online. I think asking for engagement once in a while is fine. I think it's when people do it constantly that it's annoying, but. I wanna to touch uh, a little bit on how to keep your content fresh. So uh, as we know, we're about to enter a season where we're seeing ad after ad and we're seeing quite a lot of stuff about buy product, buy this. Uh, so building a well-rounded strategy is really important. It'll help combat that overconsumption feeling of the holidays. So we wanna be sure to balance your specials and promotions with other content that inspires, entertains, or educates. I think it would be really helpful if they had an example Instagram grid that showed a balance of sort of buy stuff posts with some of this more holistic content, because I would love to see the distribution of it because they say it's nice to keep it balanced, but it would be helpful to see what balanced looks like. That being said, we do know that specials and promotions are the seasonal bread and butter. So consider mixing strategies like promo codes, buy one, get one offers, product and service bundles, giveaways, even connecting with a local charity. For example, free shipping is a top three reason why consumers choose to make a purchase from a particular retailer or brand. And with many shoppers focused on cost this year, rather than shipping times and return policies like we've seen in the past, discounted and free shipping is an easy win. In fact, over half of shoppers say that they're more likely to purchase online than, uh, than in-store if delivery is free. That makes sense. Once you have your ideas and your timeline and your schedule and your plan, it's time to create holiday themed scroll stopping visual timeline schedules and plans. Like I understand we're supposed to plan this ahead of time, but do they have some kind of schedule or, or checklist or some other template that we can use to organize ourselves? Otherwise this seems very general to me, but I think I was expecting that going into this. So for your campaigns. This task can be a little bit daunting, but luckily I have uh, a few tips, tips and tricks up my sleeve to help you unwrap holiday success. 
I have a feeling that she's going to plug GoDaddy's design, whatever it's called, that's like Canva. It's here. So we're going to start by developing a theme for your holiday campaign that can be sprinkled across all your visuals to create cohesive and recognizable content. We want folks to be able to spot your brand immediately and anywhere. Decide between using brand colors or a holiday themed color palette. On one hand, using brand colors can help reinforce brand recognition, but holiday colors are fun and can evoke a festive feeling to show your customers that you're in the holiday spirit. Um, to help with consistency, uh, use similar design elements across your content like fonts or graphics. And the goal is to make it clear that your holiday content connects. Um, it, this includes things like your website banners um, and even images. You're good, Jeffrey. We can go to the next one. Yeah. If you're short on inspiration or need a helping hand. Uh Jeffrey doesn't seem to have the slide timing exactly right here. Oh, look, they're about to plug GoDaddy Studio, which is sort of their version of Canva. But I think what would be really helpful here and what I think a lot of people run into is they want to make content that feels the same, right? And obviously they're going to have to post multiple times over the course of multiple weeks leading up to the holidays. So how do they make graphics that feel the same and go together, but don't look like copies of one another? So I would, for example, love to see, here is an example campaign uh, for a coffee shop that has chosen this graphic style and, and whatever. And here's how they made five different posts with matching branding. And as you see, there's a cohesive look, but they also feel different enough from one another that they're individually interesting. So I think that would be really helpful here. Uh, GoDaddy Studio has thousands of holiday templates and graphics to help you get started. And now I am a little biased. I do actually work really closely with this team. Um, I'm on this team. I, I help uh, um, curate a lot of these graphics and templates that come into this app. So uh, a little bit biased, but it's really great and really easy if you're a little intimidated by making a graphic for your sale or promotion, that kind of thing. Um, and so all the graphics you've seen in this webinar today are... Uh, from GoDaddy Studio, and you can find them uh, via web or mobile device. Just a little plug. All right, next one. It's a free webinar. Plug away. Jeffrey, perfect. Okay, and lastly, for our tips, uh, don't forget your captions. So captions provide context, add personality, and enhance the impact of visuals, making sure your message is clear even if customers only skim through the content. Create captions that really show your brand voice, that sound like you. They help sell your product just as much as the visual. And it's important to have a little fun. It, it would be nice to see some examples. It fits your brand. Uh, the holidays are a great time to get creative and have fun with your words. Okay, so up to this point, we've talked about getting to know your customers, when to plan your holiday campaign, and even some tips around how and what to post. I wanna take a minute now before we move into our Q&A to talk about post-holiday maintenance and the importance of nurturing your audience well into the new year. Who was scratching the crap out of my chair? It was you. Oh, I went, Bart says hi. It's like, hi, hi. <laughs> okay, you can go. Hold on, let's make some space for you. This cat picks the most random times that he wants attention. I think he'll settle down on my desk momentarily here, but he's also biting the crap out of one of my hands right now. So if I wince during this presentation, it's probably about the cat. What is Q5 and why is it important? So in holiday marketing, Q5 refers to the period after Q4, obviously. Uh, that spans the first few weeks of the new year. So usually between January and like mid-February, I'd say. It's kind of considered a fifth quarter in retail, even though it's not an official business quarter in business terms, but it's really important because it's a great opportunity for brands to maintain that momentum that we're building through the major holiday shopping season. During this time, people are often still in a spending mindset. So particularly with New Year's resolutions, Christmas returns, um, winter sales still in full swing. So people, while, you know, have spent a lot of money or may have spent a lot of money for the holidays, they still have a little ways to go after the big event is done. What we don't want to do is spend all this time building and nurturing an audience, gaining new followers through the holiday season, 
only to lose them once the decorations come down. Nurturing those new followers and new customers is one way to set yourself up for success through the rest of the year. Uh, some ways you can do this include offering post-holidays deals and promotions. So things like clearance sales, they're a great way to move that leftover inventory. Gift card promotions, they're perfect for those who receive gift cards during the holidays. Focus on email marketing. So the next couple of months in that timeline we talk about when we're laying our foundation, ask people to sign up for your email list. That way you can follow up with them after the holidays. You can also consider text marketing. Uh, I, that can work well for certain kinds of businesses. And regardless of whether you choose email or text, it is nice to keep in touch with people on a regular basis. It's a cost-effective way uh, to personalize and nurture your audience. And then also you can send a well-crafted thank you series or post-holiday promotion through email to re-engage that audience. And then a personalized follow-up. So everyone loves a personalized thank you. You can send those through emails to your holiday shoppers with a special offer for their next purchase or using insights from Q4. So if you have that, or if your website collects data, that sort of thing, um, or you can even use insights from your social platforms to send targeted promotions based on customers' previous purchases, preferences, or browsing behavior. I will say that I don't like how focused on discounts this training has been. In particular, because like most small businesses are running on pretty narrow margins or can't afford to continuously discount or put stuff on sale. There has to be some other ways to appeal to your customers besides that, that I think it would be really nice if they spent some time talking about. And let's face it, we all know businesses where there's stuff that is constantly on sale and having something be constantly on sale means that no one ever wants to pay retail price ever again for stuff. So I would say tread with the constant discounts lightly and think about instead things that people might want from your business that aren't discounts. So maybe there's personalized shopping opportunities. Maybe you hold events as part of your business. Maybe every month you pick a different charity where a certain percentage of the proceeds are going to go to. There's plenty of things to talk about that aren't discounts to keep in touch with people. Just saying. I do appreciate, though, that it sounds like they're going to have a pretty big part of this big Q&A. So. Awesome. OK. All right, folks. So I have yapped a lot. A lot of, lot of talking has gone on. OK. So let's go ahead and recap the recommendations that we covered uh, for a successful holiday season. We want to start by building your foundation by planning to post earlier than you think and lean into the ways your specific brand can help amplify and support your customers' celebrations this holiday season. Next, we want to create content that converts and drives sales through consistency and eye-catching designs. And finally, we want to nurture that audience in Q5 by maintaining connections through email, post-holiday sales or specials, and, and or a personalized thank you. By focusing on these key areas, I have full faith you'll be able to effectively engage God, this guy really wants this presentation to be over. He keeps advancing the slide before she's done. Your target audience, <laughs> drive your sales, and have the best season yet. I don't know why she couldn't have run her own slides. Like, I think that would have solved a lot of this problem, but. And that's all I have. If I was producing this, what I would have been doing during the presentation is, as there was questions in the chat, I would be copying and pasting those questions into a document that is off screen that the presenter can see. So like a Google doc or something like that. And then I would make sure as I was going along that I would aggregate the questions that go together together. So that this way, if the presenter is going through and choosing what questions to answer, if they see that there's kind of three related questions about Instagram, the presenter could address kind of all three at the same time. So maybe that's what's going on here. I'm sort of curious how the questions are going to come in. Or if we're going to just sit awkwardly for two minutes and wait for people to come up with their questions. You did amazing. <laughs> really good. And yeah. thank you all for being here. Yeah, no, she did great. It was a very general presentation. I don't know how much more prepared you feel for the holiday season, except to say, okay, I have to sit down and plan this. But in the webinar room today, we're going to go ahead and jump into some Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, thank you for um, jumping in there. Um, we have a couple of questions in here. One question is, whenever you are getting ready for your holiday season, what is one thing that you've seen works for businesses? And what is one thing that 
you don't you think businesses should not do? Okay, so I'm going to answer these questions too. And I have a feeling that her answers and my answers will be different enough that it'll feel like you're getting a twofer. So something that I've seen work for just about every business is having some kind of gift certificate option on the website. By the way, people will buy gift certificates for all sorts of things. Uh, flying lessons. I once sold a gift certificate for a doula. You'd be surprised because sometimes people want to let their gift recipient pick something out but they also want to pick a gift certificate from a more personal place than saying, oh, here's an Amazon gift card or here's a Visa gift card. They're like, oh, here's a gift card to this, you know, art supply store that I really like, or here's a gift certificate to, you know, this spa or whatever, right? And they want to let the person pick out their art supplies or their individual spa services. So I would say have some kind of gift certificate not only for the people who want to buy something from you, but don't quite know what their recipient wants, but also you could offer it as an e gift certificate so that let's say someone orders after the shipping deadline, you can make a little gift certificate with a custom coupon code on it that you can email to the person who's giving the gift and then they can print it off on their end. So this way, they have something that'll arrive in time regardless of when they order it. So gift certificates, I think pretty much work for any kind of business. And I would say something that doesn't work for most businesses is having an unclear shipping and return policy on your website. So for example, if you only ship on Mondays, that's really helpful for me to know before I order. Or if you only accept returns within 30 days and it has to be in the original packaging, that is also good for me to know as the person about to make a purchase. We're going through something right now with one of our clients where, and I keep telling them this, but they haven't got back to me. We're trying to submit their, pro their product catalog into Pinterest so that we can pin their products theoretically, and they can tag their own products on Pinterest, but it, their products have gotten rejected. And I'm pretty sure it's because their shipping and return policy on their website is pretty unclear. And that is one of the criteria that Pinterest uses to accept uh, their product catalogs into their program. So clarifying that not only will help your customers, but also will help you if you're bringing your products into other places online, like uh, the Pinterest product catalog or the meta, what's it called now? Commerce manager. I forget what they call it now, but when you bring your products into those platforms, one of the things they require of you is to have a clear shipping and return policy. So I would say that not having one or having an unclear one is something that doesn't work for most businesses. But let's see what Jessica has to say. I think the idea of that planning ahead, you don't want to go too early. You want to time it really like have a sweet spot with when you're going to push, start pushing those like holiday products. There's like a holiday fatigue. So just being really mindful of that, because I think the winning side of that is, you know, engaging with what's going on online, engaging with the type of content. So if people are talking about Halloween, don't try to sneak in a Black Friday sale if, you know, people quite, aren't quite there yet. You can have all that prepared, have all that planned, but um, don't pull the trigger too close, you know, you know, too close to the event and also too far out. So there's that, that timeline that we talked about earlier is really key there. Um, and then, yeah, not having a well-balanced strategy. So we see often a lot of folks, especially if you're really focused on trying to sell and push products, you folks might just focus on those like promotions or sell, 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 sell. Um, but we want to do is, you know, no one wants to buy from someone they don't trust or they don't know the brand. So you want to build that as you go along. Um, I think that's kind of the two sides is like, you don't want to jump the gun and you don't want to wait too late, but then also you don't want to just um, talk about your products the whole time. We want to talk about you, your staff, um, the services you offer, the value you provide, because that way people will be able to know you. Yeah. Another question, and sorry, <laughs> you talked about Q5. When is the best time to start planning for Q5 and any tips? other than what you said in the webinar to make us have a successful 2025. So in terms of the Q5 part, you know, that sort of January, February part of things, I would like to know what's going on maybe mid-November. I would push it further away if the holidays just weren't so crazy and it wasn't so hard to get a hold of people. But it would be helpful to know, are you doing a Valentine's Day related promotion? 
are you plugging into the local winter festival that's happening the first week of March? Are you getting new products coming in at the beginning of January that we should make sure get photographed and start getting promoted online? These are all helpful things for us to know as the marketing agency so that we are not being reactive and finding out that you're doing an event next week <laughs> and that we have to like scramble and make sure everything, you know, social media, email, everything happens. And then there's not enough people that went to the event because we didn't promote it long enough. We want to prevent that from happening because it helps us do our job better if we have a longer timeline to promote things. But also it helps us organize campaigns if we know what's coming up. So I would say three-ish months ahead of time in general is helpful. But I also understand that sometimes things can come up a little bit later than that, that we have to deal with. But in the ideal world, to me, for January, you should maybe be planning in November. But let's see what she says what you need to do to set up your goals for 2025. So if you see a really successful holiday season and you have like sold out of all of your small batch inventory or you have gained a ton of followers, like depending on the success, you can then change what your strategy is for the new year. Q5 is a really sure. great way to kind of jumpstart the goals. for the You know what? That's a really good point. There could be something that happens leading up to the holidays that makes us change our marketing strategy that would be happening in early January. So it's good to have a tentative plan, but also to be flexible so that if there's a sudden influx of 10,000 followers, what are we going to do with that? Well, we can figure that out. So good point, Jessica, these things do happen. The new year. So let's say you want to do a rebrand. Okay. So then you're going to start updating all of your followers in Q5 with your new branded assets, your new posts that show your new brand. Um, or if you want to uh, gain followers. It's a great time to boost awareness for your brand. So we're reaching out to people. We're having them sign up for your email list. You know, if you if you didn't see that in Q4, you can then start pushing that in Q1 or that Q5 to then roll you into the spring, uh, where you can then do spring sales and product promotions and really start amping up the sales as the year goes. Is Q is Q5 another time um, where we could also gain more customers or and content to get more customers. I definitely, yeah. for sure. I think, so when you look at your strategy, the holiday hustle. The I think what she's going to get into is the fact that like, you've just been telling people all of kind of mid-November through December, buy stuff, buy stuff, buy stuff. And they need a moment to catch their breath. It's not to say that you're not going to post an occasional piece of content about a product you have for sale or something, but just that people are going to need a little bit of recovery time after the holidays in terms like financially and also sort of mentally from seeing all these posts online. So it's not that you're not selling products. It's just that there's less of an emphasis on it to give people time to recover from the holiday. This like crunch time, um, it, it's, it's going to slow down. Like if you stop and plan, you can kind of stretch it out. Right. But then when you get to Q1, it's going to feel like a fresh beginning, like a new start. And then what's really important is then taking that data taking any of your insight. And that could even mean just looking at your sales and say like, where did I sell stuff? What sold the best? Uh, and then using those insights to then reach new people. Or let's say you use January to come up with new products or new ideas for services. And then you can then start over and say, okay, uh, in 2025, I want to try to reach a different type of audience. Um, so here's the plan for that. And here's how I'm going to try to do that based on what we're doing in 2024. I love that. And I also love how you're not like aggressively planning. You're doing this yeah. in like chunks of time. And you're also like saving yourself some time, even in the new year as well, because yeah. you're looking at that Q5 time, just like you said. Yeah. Uh, Having what, a timeline is great as far as like throughout the year, but you don't, it, it should have a little wiggle room. What does, and this is coming from me because you just brought this up. What does, what would that timeline look like? So within my, I'm not really sure what he's asking here because it would depend, but let's see how she answers favorite it. Favorite thing to do is look at seasonality, right? And within the beginning of the year, it's a fresh start. You're going to set your goals for the year. So let's say by the end of the year, you want to gain X amount of followers or you want to sell X amount of products or you want to 
build an email list up until X amount. So set those numbers and those goals. Well, they should be flexible. You know, life happens, things go up and down, trends come and go. But um, being able to kind of have the, those goals in mind will help you kind of reverse engineer your strategy. So if you're looking to build followers, right? You don't have a lot of big following online and that's your goal, one of your main goals, brand awareness, right? So in January, you're gonna start by uh, having a lot of content that showcases you as the human behind your brand and business. That's highlighting your employees. That's having interacting with audience. So ask questions online, um, maybe hold a, I know they're scary, have a live Q and A on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> if I can do it, everybody could do it. I promise. Uh, but you know, you want to show you Jessica, don't sell yourself short. You're doing great. I will say that live video can be a hard format if you don't have a dedicated space for it. So like in my case, I share an office with my partner and we have a small house that also has two cats and a dog in it. And I don't really have any other space to do this besides here because I rented out the offices of our co-working space. Like they're all rented out right now, which honestly, fantastic problem to have, but I don't have a room I can duck into anymore. So yeah, like I'm not at a time in my life where I could do a lot of sort of live streaming unless people didn't mind hearing a dog randomly start barking or my partner randomly like coming in the house or whatever. Um, and once I have my own space, I'll feel a lot more comfortable scheduling regular live streams and running them. But until then, it's just not something that really works for me as a format. For example, I've been recording for almost two hours because I've been interrupted a bunch of times. But this video, as you see, is not two hours long. So there you go. I think live video can be great, but I also understand if people are not super comfortable on live video. And even if they are, that maybe they're in a circumstance where like that would be a little bit difficult to do in a professional way. So for your face, you want to get people to trust you and build that, um, build that faith with your audience. Um, and then over time, sprinkle in those products and services, sprinkle in the value. I think that's key too here is you don't just want to showcase a product and not, not explain like why or how it's going to help somebody. Um, I love he asked about a timeline and she's just like, yeah, um, here's some different formats that you can use for people to get to know you. I mean, it's not really a timeline, I guess. And maybe it's because she doesn't know how to answer his question either. Because I certainly because don't. Because what converts is understanding that value. So same thing with the holiday planning. When someone's like, oh, I, I have company coming in town. I have to plan a Thanksgiving dinner. And I'm going to have 12 people at my house. Not only maybe they are looking for a new table setting. Maybe they're looking for a gift for somebody. Maybe they're looking for someone to help them clean their home or uh, rent a car, those sorts of things. So all of those little moments, like really thinking of both your brand as like humanize your brand and then also humanize your audience. So really put yourself in their shoes. Um, so taking those things, those same principles and putting them into Q1 uh, through the spring. This is long winded. I can talk about this stuff all day, as you know. Uh, but yeah, so then once you're in the spring, um, <laughs> you can then start activating. So we're thinking people might be traveling for spring break. We have kids who are, you know, fully back in, you know, in school, but maybe gearing up to be out of school closer to May, June. I think I'm following the train of thought now. So he asked about a timeline. And so what she's saying is, I like to think about my marketing seasonally. So let's use our co-working space as an example. Maybe in November and December, our co-working space marketing should concentrate around, hey, is there a lot of extra people in your house at the holidays? Come to Anchor Space where you can like get work done and it's quiet and laid back, but we have a nice professional setting for you to be in. Or maybe if you have a holiday list of things you need to do, come to Anchor Space and get, you know, all your gifts wrapped or get all of your Christmas cards addressed without anyone interrupting you while you do your tasks. And then maybe when it comes to, you know, January, maybe our messaging turns into, is your New Year's resolution to be more productive? Did you know being a member of a co-working space can help you be more productive? Is your New Year's resolution to make friends? A co-working space is a great place to make friends. You know, so I would change my messaging. I still have the same core products. I still have a rentable, you know, shared office space. But my messaging changes as people might be thinking about their work life differently, uh, you know, in November versus in January. 
he was like, is there a calendar? That's kind of how I understood it. And she's like, I think about my messaging in terms of the seasonality of the calendar year. So I think that's what's going on here. Then you're in the summer and people are on vacation. So how can you meet those needs? So I wouldn't say that the timeline, the, and then I was going to say, then once you get into July, you're prepping for holidays already. So the front half of the year is really building towards the end of your goals, but that can look different depending on the goal, the business, your audience, all of that. I love that. Okay. Two more questions as of right now. Um, Stephanie says, I do crochet. Crochet. God, if I can talk. <gasps> All right. A fellow crocheter. Oh. I love it. I uh, I crochet um, mainly fairs and festivals, so not much online sales. But mm -hmm. what about fairs doing in-person business and not just online? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. So this is what I would do. I would maybe figure out a way that you can maybe live stream from the event. So because you're at your booth and you're live streaming and maybe you, you don't turn the camera on your customers, maybe unless like you get their permission, maybe the camera is trained on you and in between customers, you're talking to the camera about what's going on, what you're seeing, what other products are there. And because you're kind of doing this continuous commentary and live stream at the event, other people at the event might like start sharing your stream, including the event organizers. So I think that's one way to sort of build excitement about, Hey, I'm at this event. You should come down, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're sort of talking about it as it's happening. And I also think that you talking ahead of the event about, Hey, we're going to this event. Hey, we're really excited about, we're going to be at this event and we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z and, and selling our products, you know, and, and really like, build the excitement for the event and then maybe live streaming while you're there, I think would be a good way to get more people at the event. And like I said, because you're talking about the event and helping the event organizers promote it by the way you're talking about it, your stuff is more likely to be shared, but let's see what she says. As someone who also crochets and from time to time also likes to sell at small events, um, I can say that while you might not be selling online, having an online presence is still big, especially it does depend on your audience. So I have a friend who does something similar and she does highlight a lot of her um, products online. And then people will say like, she'll, she'll drop whenever she's going to a, a mar craft market or a Christmas fair, something like that. She'll put that online to make sure people know where to find her one, yeah. two, um, make sure that everything's really cohesive. So if you have a brand online and people might be Googling you, make it easy for them to find you. So then when they do see you in person, they recognize your brand. Um, and I know maybe if you're a one person brand and you're like, it, it's just me, it's not that big of a deal. I don't really know, but it does really help to kind of have something well-designed like a logo or some, something that you can put out even physically, um, physical branding materials that kind of help that recognition. Um, a little like side tidbit that has really worked for me and other people in the past is to make sure that um, your table is really inviting. Um, if you have a booth or something uh, that you're selling at, uh, yeah, make sure it's really inviting and take content, pictures, videos while you're there or have someone else do it for you. Mm -hmm. Then you can reuse that content afterwards and showcase, hey, we were at this event. Look at the stuff we sold. Look at yeah, except I think I would also post it while you were there so that people would have time to to come in. Like if I knew that there was a, a Saturday, Sunday event and I saw that, you know, my artist friend was at this event and it was going on all weekend and it was about 30 minutes away or something. If I saw it on Saturday, I would have time to go on Sunday and see them there. So get the people buying the stuff, building that social. And if I do the same show again, when I'm promoting like, oh, we're going to be at, you know, the craft food and wine fair or something. I have pictures and video from the previous event that I can use to promote the upcoming event when it happens the next year. So yeah, I, I agree with this uh, in terms of having content for, you know, obviously at the event, but also for the future of your social media posts. To prove that people can trust you and should shop with you again. Um, and also it's a great time at those booths, like in person to say, Hey, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram. I would actually use my energy instead to get their email address. Or if I was going to do text marketing to get their cell phone number, because 
then when you reach back out to them, you can always remind them that you have social media, right? But um, but yeah, my customers who have like an in-person business, who have like a retail store or a bed and breakfast or something, they collect so many more email addresses than I do with my marketing company that works out of a co-working space. Even though I have lots of ways for people to sign up for our email list online, there is just more of an opportunity when you're standing in front of somebody for them to write their email address. You're going to collect it a lot faster. Yeah. Also, if you want an email about where I'll be next, sign up for this email list. Like those are all things you can still do in person as well. And okay. sometimes it works better because mm -hmm. they see you and they know you, they know that you're not yeah. a stranger. Yeah. Very true. And I, I love all of that. And also connection and a business owner to a business owner. So some great advice right there. Yeah. I love it. I love the crochet. <laughs> That's so fun. I get to geek out about marketing and crochet. <laughs> I'll see myself out. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everybody. No. <laughs> I was like, wait, we have one more question. Yeah. <laughs> asked. Oh, interesting. There's one more question, but there's 10 minutes left. So I'll be really curious how they fill the extra time here. Well, I'm pretty fluent with using Facebook. I am new to Instagram and would love to start using it, especially for holiday promos. Is there any site link you recommend as a good intro basics for using Instagram? I think, uh, one, we have a lot of great resources. Um, I'm GoDaddy. I'm, I'm going to plug some of the blogs that we have. Definitely look some stuff up there. We have quite a few different resources for folks getting started with social. Two, one of my, I think, one of my top tips is to look at what other people in your industry are doing on social media. So mm -hmm. go to their pages. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone who's near you. It can be just go on Instagram and kind of look up, let's say, I don't know exactly what type of business you have, but um, if you look up the different types of business, you can even. I mean, the platforms are pretty similar, right? When you think about Instagram, there's just more of an emphasis on reels and stories I find than Facebook. So there's in-feed posts, there's reels, and there's stories. So once you learn about those three types of content, where they show up and how different businesses are using them, I feel like the platform becomes a lot less intimidating. Obviously, Facebook also has reels and stories. But what I find is when I post reels and stories on Facebook, almost nobody watches them. But when I post them on Instagram, a lot more people watch them because they're looking for them there, I think. And there's tons of Instagram guides out there. So if you were like, oh, how do I add an audio to my Instagram reel or something, there are tons of tutorials about how to do specific things. But if you understand the types of posts and the slight nuance differences between them, I think that will make your life a lot easier. Google like those types of businesses and then find their Instagrams on their websites. But then look at what type of content is working and what's not working. Um, Cause it does, it's gonna change depending on your audience and depending on your um, business type. And you can cross post. So if you love Facebook and what you're doing on Facebook is really working, take that, that content and put it on Instagram. You can, you can use those mm -hmm. photos, those carousels, like I talked about earlier with multiple photos. Um, I'm glad she's not villainizing reposting content because Honestly, that works for a lot of people. Try out some video content, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, looking at what other businesses is a great way to kind of get started and get your feet wet with like, okay, so they have a product highlight, they're highlighting a service or product. Then they have a post that's asking a question. Then they have a post about behind the scenes, like what are they doing? They're packing orders, that sort of thing. So taking that framework and then making your own and adding your brand voice and your brand behind it is what's going to help you get started i think um but yeah sorry that was a long-winded explanation but definitely what's working on facebook could definitely work on instagram jessica don't apologize you're answering a question you're going to use words to do it it's fine and then the biggest thing here for me too is um always be iterating your strategy so let's say you get started on instagram and you see uh you start seeing followers rack up, right? We hit 50 followers, we hit 100 followers, we hit 200 followers. Well, then take a look at that and see what's performing with your audience and then change the content as you go there. Um, because new followers may like different types of content. I love that. And you're not wrong, like especially me with our like posting on social, it is one of those things of where you want to post different things and you have to tweak it to the different audiences. You don't want to really use the same language, the same captions, um, even right. if you're using hashtags, like each platform is like talking to, I would like to say a different friend group 
that you might have. She just said reposting content was okay. And he's like, well, it should be different for the different platforms. I mean, I don't disagree with him, but if getting over the hurdle of using Instagram involves you reposting the content you're putting on Facebook for now, while you explore Instagram, I think that that's okay too. Oh, great. That's such a good way to put it. And not that like you should show up any different for your friends, but like things they like and dislike. So you kind of have to know like their icks and their oohs. Um, yeah. So that's really important to know. <laughs> about your audience and when you're it's on funny. social media is like Jessica was saying, knowing the platform and knowing like if you're posting something for a sale here, um, you might want to put like some extra things in the caption on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You might want to put hook put a link that's clickable on Facebook that would direct them. We've been experimenting with using less hashtags on Instagram. So using like four instead of using like seven or eight. And anecdotally i will say and it's early on but the posts with less hashtags appear to be doing better but i'll keep you posted as we run that experiment a little longer to your website or an order page or anything like that mm -hmm. so i will say this and we have one more question is tell your customers what to do and i know that sounds kind of wild but if i click on an email and it doesn't really give me like a cta or anything to do i'm not going to really like right you know, to do CTA is call to action. Again, if you're introducing an acronym, like let's not assume that everyone necessarily knows what it is. I'm going to click out of it. I'm like, well, that was a waste of my time. But right. if it's like sale, and I don't even know what this sale could be about. It's just a sale. <laughs> Save money. Okay. <laughs> sure. it's sale, like the graphic gets me. I have bought cookbooks just based on the cover, which I do not do, but I do, <laughs> do but don't do. I am guilty cookbooks. of that as well. Yes. <laughs> So like definitely make sure that you're like looking at your- I also love cookbooks. I have a whole shelf that is just cookbooks because I just love them so much. The audience are looking at your platforms. Um, mm -hmm, I'm just definitely. Talking, but Stephanie did have a question. Um, okay. I'm doing two huge fears. Stephanie has all the questions apparently. I'm wondering how many people are actually watching this webinar. In November, never done it before. So I'm going to going into it blindly okay. with expecting thousands of customers. So don't know what to expect. It's except um, to look business professional and have good looking displays. Any other advice? Okay. So the question is, all right, I'm at an event, I'm selling my stuff. And other than me looking professional and my stuff looking good on the table, what can I do? And I would do these three things. Number one, I would have some kind of way to collect either email addresses or phone numbers if I was doing a texting list. And I would give something away or or do something to get those. So for example, if I do crochet stuff, I might say, put your name and email address to get on our list and you will be entered to win one of three free crochet hats that we'll draw for at the end of the event. So that just gives a little extra incentive for someone to sign up for your email list. And so maybe they drop their business card in, in the fishbowl, or maybe you have little slips of paper, they can write their name and email address on there. And you draw three free ones at the end of the event. So incentivize getting email addresses and actually get them. Number two, at the event, I would connect with the other vendors. So I would get maybe somebody to man my table at a time in the event where it's a little bit slow. And I would go around and I would meet the other vendors at the event. And I would introduce myself and I would see if I could connect with them. And you might, in addition to finding some good connections, you might find some useful information like oh, you know, this other vendor goes to this event that I've never heard of, and it's one of their best performing events. Maybe I should consider going to that. Or, oh, there's a local, you know, group online that exchanges these kind of craft supplies. I didn't know about that. I learned about that from this other vendor. So in connecting with other people, it's a great way to not only be a nice participant in the event because you're connecting with the other people, and maybe somebody comes to my table at the event later and they're like looking for pot holders. Well, I don't have any pot holders, but Dan over there has a ton of great pot holders at his booth. I just saw them a while ago. They're beautiful. They come in every color. So I could be sending people to the other vendors too and kind of helping them out. And maybe they would do similar. So as we're at these various crafting events and I'm probably running into not the exact same people, but maybe some of the same people that I could build that relationship over time. And number three, 
I would do something to promote the event. Like I said, so whether I'm live streaming from my table, whether I check in on Facebook and say like, Hey, I'm at this event and I tag the event organizers and, you know, so I would promote the event because let's face it, if you're organizing the event, everyone always thinks you should have done more marketing, no matter how much marketing you've done. So if you're helping this event, get more people to come to it, they're going to see you as a good partner to have at their event. They're going to maybe remember that next year that you posted about the event and that some people came in specifically to see you at the event. And that's a lovely position to be in because most groups that organize events either organize one very large event every year or they organize multiple events. And so it's good to get in good with the event organizers. They might give you a great table location. They might shout you out on social media at the event to their audience, which is beyond your audience. So I would say do those three things. And I think you're taking advantage of the in-person event experience. But let's see what Jessica has to say. I think, um, so last year, oh, yes, Jeffrey? I'm sorry. Okay. So one thing that I have learned and I have recommended to do is if you can, take a screenshot if you can print it out. And if you do have your socials, especially like on Instagram, you can always go to your profile. And if you're wanting more followers, like Jessica was saying, sorry, also to interrupt as well, I'm, I apologize. No, go for it. Um, is when you go to share your profile, it comes up as a QR code. So most people have like a camera on their phone and they can easily go scan it and it'll direct them right to your profile and instant follow right there. So mm -hmm. I, I know that kind of sounds old fashioned, but I can Wait, so where's the QR code? It's on your website or it's on your social media? I don't know. I think they could also just see your handle and type it in, but that might be old fashioned of me. I cannot tell you how many times. And now that we're so programmed to scan QR codes, um, I, I will say in a post COVID world, we are more apt to scan a QR code because we all had to learn how to do them at restaurants and other places when they were doing the contactless stuff. So I will say it is a more QR code friendly world than it was even five years ago. I think it's like a very good solution as well if you're wanting more followers. Um, mm -hmm. That way you can always whip out your phone, anything like that. It can easily scan, follow you, another follower right there. But yeah. Yeah. And with that, um, I, as someone who also frequents like craft fairs and craft markets and those sorts of things, um, I sometimes will browse and be like, okay, I want to see what, I want to see everything that's here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm the person that always takes a business card because I will look you up on Instagram and like DM you if I actually really want a product later. Um, I don't, maybe not everyone, but even if two, let's say you have 10 people walk by and two of them do that, that's still a great, like that's still a sale. So um, if you have any ma printed materials, like small business cards that you can set up, um, that's a great way to make sure that someone's walking away with a reminder of your brand. That's a great starting point. Um, and then again, yeah, I think like letting the people know who you know in person, know that you're gonna be there. So be like, hey, I'm gonna be at this fair. Tell everybody you know, like word of mouth is huge. So if you're looking for um, a Christmas gift, if you're looking for um, some sort of holiday treat for somebody, um, telling the people you know those things and then they can tell their friends. So like word of mouth with like the craft community and like fairs and markets like that is actually huge. So definitely do that. And then, like I said, make sure you're posting leading up to it to make sure that people know that you're going to be there. Um, and also good luck. It's so fun. And people are way nicer than you think. Like yeah. I was really nervous when I first started doing them. Um, but you just have to be friendly and fun and nice, which I'm sure you are. So like it, it really will shine through. Um, and yeah, and I, I think it's especially this time of year and like around the holidays, people are just excited to kind of see what there is and talk. And so mm -hmm. I'm, you know, maybe suggest and offer ways that they can use your products that you're offering. So if you do crochet and you're offering um, maybe blankets or scarves or hats or garlands, that sort of thing, say like, oh, this would make a great stocking stuffer. This makes a great ornament exchange item. Or, oh, do you have a secret Santa coming up? This is really great. Or this is so great for a baby, you know, a new parent for their baby or something like that. So always keep your audience in mind. Always keep in mind how people, uh, how you can provide value for folks and connect it back to the holiday season. 
I love that so, so much. And I want to say thank you to everyone that's attended the webinar today. We really, truly do appreciate y'all, all the great questions. Um, I want to give a huge, huge thanks to Jessica um, for not only volunteering her time, but also um, engaging. I hope she was paid for this presentation. I don't know about the volunteering the time part. GoDaddy is a giant corporation. If someone's coming on to present information, they should be being paid for their time somehow. Coming up with this great content to show y'all as well. and I'll But maybe volunteer just means she offered to do it, in which case that's fine. But sometimes the word volunteer, I'm like, oh, when a large corporation would ask me to volunteer something, I'd be like, mm, I don't know. I think you could pay for it. That, but just making sure that y'all walked away with some tangible things um, that you can actually put in place as well. And before I go... <laughs> Yeah, I know. One more. What are one the more, one more. One okay. more. What are the best strategies sell print on? What are the best strategies for selling print on demand products with stock mockups? Without this is how to sell print on demand products, which are products that basically are like drop ship things that are custom printed. So the thing is, when you sell a product. A big thing that I think people want to see and why they're buying on social media, places like TikTok shops, is that seeing a video of the product gives you an idea of sort of its quality, its fit, uh, you know, it's it's different than seeing a stock photo on a website to, to see someone interact with it on a video. So what I would do is I would maybe order three to five t-shirts from my print on demand supplier and I'd get them in different colors and with different designs on them. And then I would record some content while I was wearing the t-shirts. And maybe I wouldn't necessarily talk about the t-shirts, but I would talk about running my, you know, print on demand business. And I would talk about like, okay, well, how, how do I, how do I pick the designs that go in the store? How often do I change the designs of the store? You know, um, what is the history of this particular t-shirt and design that I have wearing right now? Um, how did I pick the type of t-shirts that we use? And maybe I, I picked a really high quality, you know, cotton and it's cut a certain way and whatever. And I want to talk about that. So I think I would create content around that, but I would actually want to see a physical version of my product. And I also want to make sure that the product was, was good, right? Because <laughs> if you have never ordered even a sample from this print on demand site, and you're now trying to start a business with it, I'd want to make sure the quality was good, because all you would need is to have a, your first few customers have a bad experience, and it would be really hard for you to recover from that. So if I had a print on demand business, that's what I would do. But let's see what Jessica uh, offers here as advice. About having to buy the item. Right. Not having, so not having to buy the item, I think that's gross. If you are asking other people to buy something and you're not even willing to buy a couple of versions of it, I don't know. I think that's kind of gross personally, but let's see if Jessica handles it better than I would in real life, which is I'd be roll my eyes and be like, I'm sorry if you don't want to spend like 50 bucks on your business, like you've got bigger problems in marketing. But when it comes to digital products, um, I think creating your own mock-ups with online. So tools like GoDaddy Studio um, or and other tools that have those types of templates already built in. Sometimes you can find them for free online and you can just superimpose your image, remove a background. Yeah, I mean, you could use the picture of the random guy wearing the white t-shirt and put your design on it. But how does the customer know about the size and placement of that graphic if it's accurate or not? Because as a woman with a large chest, I have to be careful when I order anything with a print on it, because if it is placed in the wrong spot, it doesn't look good. <laughs> so I don't know. I would order some samples and make sure that the color and placement and all that was as expected, but that's just ground from one and put it into a mock-up, like a t-shirt, or if you do have a digital item, like an ebook or something, you can then showcase that um, in a graphic. I think those visual ways, again, you want to provide clarity and set expectations really clearly about what the customer is going to get. Um, so I think something like that 
is a great place to start. Yeah. I hope that helps. I know it's kind of digital products are a little bit different than in-person services and products, but um, kind of the same principles apply. So you want to build trust with that audience and make sure you're setting the right expectations. And how are you going to set their expectations if you yourself have not interacted with the product? That's what I want to know. I think Jeffrey is also wondering this as well. I love it. And oh, let me make sure. Ah, yes. They know. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Um, and a huge, huge thank you to Jessica. Everyone give her a round of applause. Like I'm screaming, I'm clapping right now. <laughs> um, but I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm throwing myself on the floor. No, thank you so much, Jessica, for volunteering. Like, well, I asked her. Um, <laughs> okay. So he asked her, I think she's being paid for her time. I can, I can feel better about that. <laughs> um, but taking time out of your busy schedule to one, do this, two, speaking to everyone and giving like real practical advice and three, just being awesome and just being <laughs> an amazing person and knowing all about content. Like she's amazing. Like I said, stop. stop. I'm going to blush though. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for inviting me and having me here today. Thanks everybody for your wonderful questions. I really hope you all have a great holiday season and like just take the stuff that we talked about today and have the best season yet for sure. Yes. Thank you all so much and have a great Tuesday. I almost said Wednesday. Have a great Tuesday and we will see you all here next time. So that wasn't terrible, but it also was quite general, which honestly is what we were expecting. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you have a guru, a video, a concept that you would like me to react to, you can leave it as a comment on this video, or if you're more shy, you can leave it on the contact form of our website at breakingeveninc.com slash contact. If you want to lightly keep in touch, a good way to do that is through our email newsletter, breakingeveninc.com slash newsletter, where you can see some examples of past issues so you can see if you want to get into it or not before you sign up if you like this content i would take a look at the nicole reacts playlist which is both on the youtube channel under nicole reacts as well as under the nicole reacts category of the blog you can see literally over a hundred videos there from over a hundred different marketing gurus and remember to like, comment, share the video, and otherwise help get it out in the algorithm. I appreciate any and all efforts in particular as a small channel. So thanks again so much for watching. And remember, these gurus, they'll just keep on coming. But the good news is you have a friend, and that's me in the marketing business, who's not afraid to call them on all their bullshit and is going to watch holiday marketing videos with you every year. Happy holidays to you and yours, and I'll see you in another video. Take care.